And we are joined by James Kilgore, longtime leftist activist and author of Understanding Ecarceration, Electronic Monitoring, The Surveillance State, and the Future of Mass Incarceration. Uh, James, thank you so much for being here today. I, I, I'm very excited to talk to you because I your book talks a little bit about your firsthand experience being under state surveillance for much of your adulthood. Um, but I also wikipedia would you and, and saw some of your longtime activism and the price that you paid for it. So I, I guess we can start there. Um, talk a little bit about your experience of being under state surveillance, both in prison and un under electronic surveillance outside of, of prison. Okay, well, I mean, as I talk about in the book, I was actually, I was a fugitive for 27 years on federal uh, possession of explosive charges from the, from the mid 1970s. And I spent most of that time in Southern Africa. I spent a lot of that time doing work with social justice movements, with the liberation movements in South Africa and Zimbabwe fighting against apartheid and colonialism. Uh, in 2002, I was extradited back to the U.S. I spent six and a half years in, in, in prison in federal and state institutions in California. And when I came out in 2002, uh, sorry, in 2009, I was placed on an electronic monitor. When I got, the day after I got home, they put this thing on my ankle and they told me I would only be allowed out of the house from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., Monday through Friday. And that really kind of changed my idea of what freedom was going to look like after all those years of thinking about it. And I began to ask some questions about this device. Who made the rules for it? Who was making money off of it? And probably most importantly for today, where was this device going in terms of its capacity to surveil? At that time, it was, it was tracking location but it didn't do some, have a lot of the bells and whistles that are on devices now. And it wasn't really connected to a broader surveillance state that it is now, which is kind of what I talk about in the, in the book, which I refer to as e-carceration. And, and it's not just a surveillance state, and we can get into that. It's, it's very global, uh, which is part of what's terrifying about a lot of this technology. Um, but I guess uh, I, I, I also um, hope you could expand on how your your uh, activist work was very much a part of the liberation politics of the '70s and during that period. I mean, how did your uh, your activism and your experience with that maybe give you a different perspective on uh, the the e-carceration, electronic monitoring that you later dealt with in your life? Okay, so my, my activism in the in the 70s in the US was, I mean, I mean, I was involved in anti-war movement, but I became involved in revolutionary violence, as we called it. Um, I mean, I have a lot of I have a lot of, of reflections on that particular choice, but I think I learned a very different politics when I went to Southern Africa and I became part of mass movements which involved ordinary workers, ordinary community members who despite not having extensive formal education, who despite not being, who despite having English as their fourth or fifth language, were still able to conduct incredible political debates and political campaigns and begin to develop a model of participatory democracy, which involved ordinary people making decisions and building organizations and being able to pull 3 million people out on any given day on a general strike. So that that kind of activity really changed my idea about what politics should look like. And that's why when I, when I came back to the US, uh, I looked around inside these prisons and I saw, I, I just saw the, this endless sea of bodies coming through the gate, disproportionately black, disproportionately brown, overwhelmingly poor. And I had to try to figure out what was going on here because I hadn't really followed this phenomenon of mass incarceration. So I, when I came out, I had taken the decision that I wasn't going to be able to go back to South Africa because I was on parole. So I was going to do work in this community in the US around the issues of mass incarceration and try to apply some of the lessons that I'd learned about movement building and organizing in South Africa in 
the U.S., which is a very different politics than what I embodied in the 1970s. So I guess we can we can start there because you do talk a lot about the racial biases in some of these programs. Um, there is a sense sometimes that uh, from people that that the um, electronic monitoring, home uh, surveillance, being outside of the prison that that's got to be applied basically equally to people when that's not, of course, the case. Well, I think. That's true. I mean, one of the remarkable things about electronic monitoring is the fact that we have almost no data on it. Uh, we, we have, we do have numbers for people in prison. We can get racial breakdowns of who's in prison. But I mean, I've sent out a whole lot of Freedom of Information Act requests to states, to counties, and so forth, trying to get them to provide simple data about electronic monitoring. How many people do you have on it? What's a racial breakdown of it? How much are they paying on it if they are paying? And most importantly, how many people are being sent back to jail or to prison for minor violations, coming home late from work because the bus is delayed, having to take a child to the hospital without permission and so forth. So we don't really have data to even know what the racial bias within electronic monitoring is. The few places we do have, I mean, they're, they're as shocking as the, the racial data on mass incarceration. In Chicago, 70% of the people on electronic monitoring pretrial are black in a, in a, in a county that's 25% black. In Los Angeles, 70% of the people on electronic monitoring are black in a, in a jurisdiction that's 8% black. So there's disproportionate usage of electronic monitoring, which mirrors what happens in the mass incarceration system as a whole in prisons and jails and immigration prisons. And and we can expand on that a little bit, but I, it might be helpful to if I could ask you to define um, the term surveillance capitalism, which is a through line in your book. Um, and and how did the rise of surveillance capitalism coincide with the rise of global neoliberalism? Well, I mean, surveillance capitalism as an as an entity really means that uh, that data becomes the new sort of the new raw material for making money. So all these all these technologies, many of which I detail in as e-carceration, whether it's license plate readers, street cameras, facial recognition, electronic monitoring being kind of the classic because it's a, a clear it's clearly a process of incarceration that's more like a prison or a jail than say facial recognition which isn't which people don't necessarily associate with depriving people of their liberty but all of this is used as a way for for companies to gather data on us to try to predict our behavior and then to use those predictions either to control us if we are what i call the criminalized sector of the working class, that is poor people who are already marginalized, who are maybe been in the criminal legal system, been in the mental health system, been in substance abuse uh, programs and so forth. All of these people are already being being watched and being controlled and being blocked from access to, oppor to opportunity. But then we have the, the, you know, the broad surveillance of cell phone calls, emails and so forth, all of which gather more and more data which go to the cloud, which is owned by Amazon, Google, et cetera. And we don't know what happens to it, but I think we can guess when we get all these messages popping in onto our screens about buy this, buy that. And they're talking about something we just sent an email about two minutes ago. Yeah, well, w which makes your uh, comment about how you have sent FOIA requests and tried to get some transparency on this issue, especially ironic because the breadth and the wealth of data in this area has got to be infinite. Absolutely, but what happens is that the companies that sign the contracts for electronic monitoring aren't held to any accountability at all. So I've also sent a, around Freedom of Information Act requests to many jurisdictions asking them to give me reports, evaluations, assessments of the impact of their of their so-called programs and I I think I've managed to get about two reports that were generated by a jurisdiction or by a company. It's not part of their contract. 
the only thing that's stipulated in the contract, how much you're going to pay for the devices and what's the what are the kind of technical specs of these devices. But there's nothing about accountability. What are the rules going to be for the people who are on it? And how are we going to see if it's having an impact? Because, I mean, I call this in the book, I refer to this as the mythology of electronic monitoring. We assume it's doing something because people say this is what it's supposed to do. But there's no there's no data, there's no proof, as you as you point out, in this era where you know data re, data rules, but all of a sudden we have this surveillance technology that's gathering all this data and we can't even access it to know what it's saying about us or how it's being used against us unless we go to apply to you know rent an apartment or apply for credit and all of a sudden you know we get these numbers and these rejections back without explanation um, so it's it, it's really a a, a a cloud of mystery a cloud of mystery. There you go. Very uh, unintentional pun, uh, <laughs> potentially. But uh, I mean, it's it, I, I can't help but think of someone like Stephen Donziger uh, in this case, who's uh, been the victim of this as well. Leftist activists like yourself who've, who've undergone this. And of course, um, the the disproportionate black and brown uh, people that have have been victimized by by this kind of stuff. And and the, and the uh, I should say electronic surveillance and and incarceration and the thing about it too that the 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 purpose of it is control really um, I mean these are this is the politics of control so there's no stated purpose for the people but for the state for for the powerful there is a lot of value in being able to monitor people specifically people um, that you know are. are that you want to be good members of a capitalist society and good soldiers, that there's that there there is of course value in that for them. Oh, ab ab absolutely, and I think well, I mean one of the things you know when when Edward Snowden came out with his revelations and some of the other ones that basically let us know that the NSA is looking at our phone calls and looking at our email, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, a lot of people responded to that, and I think you know over, you know upper middle class white people in particular saying, why are you gathering data on me? I haven't done anything. Go after those people over there. But those people over there are the same people that are impacted by mass incarceration, by mass criminalization, who, you know, who get arrested for, for uh, sleeping in public or, you know, for urinating on a tree or something and end up, and end up in this cycle of incarceration. But those are the same people that 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 are criminalized by this by, by this surveillance technology by these technologies of incarceration and the state wants to keep an eye on those people to control, to control those people, people as you point out wants to, wants to wants to punish, punish them. them and 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 this and technology, this technology becomes, becomes a, a technology, technology of punishment and control so th there is i would Im and, and you write about this too but there is likely a um a, let me put put it this way. I've been very skeptical of s groups like Coke Industries or the Coke Brothers um, and and their odd push to cut back on mass incarceration. Part of that is because they want to cut costs so that um, taxes can be slashed even further, of course. But to me, there is this uh, th there seems to be a push for not the abolition of the prison industrial complex, but surveillance capitalism and uh, electronic surveillance as a replacement. Um, is that something that you've observed and, and, and that you have fears about? Well, yes. I mean, that's really what triggered me to, you know, to do all the research, to go around and interview people that have been on electronic monitoring to try to counter the notion that electronic monitors represent an alternative to incarceration in the same way that other kinds of more punitive alternatives like drug courts and mental health courts and so forth that are really infused with this notion of punishment, what we call the punishment punishment paradigm. So electronic monitoring, we, we refer to it, I mean, I work for an organization called Media Justice, and we've had a campaign called Challenging East Incarceration for several years. And part of what we try to push out on that is number one, to change the narrative that electronic monitoring is not an alternative to incarceration, but it's an alternative form of incarceration. And secondly, that as we've 
already mentioned in this in this discussion that it is it is part of the surveillance state or as you put it the the global surveillance state or the global use of this technology and, and that's one of the things i try to emphasize in the book to connect the dots between what happens on people's ankle so in the book i'm moving from people's ankle outward for the tech not to look at the way the technology is used in immigration the way it's used let's say for example in gaza against palestinians and right. so forth so i want i want us to understand that you know it's not just an an ankle shackle and i don't call it bracelet because it's not jewelry i mean that's another thing that we do is we normalize this by calling by coming up with neutral even positive uh, t terms for them but that's not what they but that's not what they are Absolutely. And I, I definitely want to talk about Palestine and zoom out with you. But another uh, piece that I think is a bit dystopian and, and scares people about this expanding surveillance uh, state is the, uh, the, the usage of facial recognition. And there are, of course, uh, racial biases in, in that. Can you talk a little bit about your research in that area and, and what you found? Well, I think I mean, fa facial recognition is there's been so many uh, studies of it to show basically that it, it, it can't, can't recognize black people. It can't identify, it, it, it claims to be able to, that, that is neutral, that is not biased, like all of these technologies do. That's part of their, that's part of their uh, selling point is it's technology. It's not, it doesn't have bias. It, humans have bias, technology doesn't. So somehow we're supposed to accept that myth. So, but we know that that in, in in you know Oprah Oprah Winfrey gets identified as a man in facial recognition technology. I mean, there's all these instances where people just you know they just can't be identified. Um, and and it's black women who are the who kind of ironically, given the punitive nature of the system, it's black women who are most likely to be misidentified by this technology. So, but yet but yet it just keeps spreading and without people having accountability. Now there have been some initiatives like in San Francisco, they've banned the use of it by, you know, by local government and there's other initiatives in, in Massachusetts and so forth, because with some of these technologies, there is no positive use for them. There, there, there is, we talk about reforming and changing them. There is no positive use for facial recognition technology that I can see. Who <laughs> yeah, except, I mean, then you'll, you'll have, um people in government or potentially co uh, companies that have quite lucrative contracts in order to provide this technology basically say, well, uh, play out uh, life as if it's a 24 episode. You got a terrorist with a bomb and you've got 24. I mean, that's when we need these technologies, but that's not what they're used for. It's just obviously not what they're used for, especially because that situation might happen once in a, a decade or a blue moon, if at all. <laughs> Right. Also, and I mean, it's it's not as if uh, people who might be targeted like that aren't going to figure out that maybe they should put a plastic nose on or something and and yeah. <laughs> distort their face. I mean, it's just like a license plate readers is another technology like that. People, uh, I mean, I, I mean, I live in Champaign, Urbana, Illinois. We just had a big battle with city councils over license plate readers and trying to show that they, you know, they it's, it's easy enough to misidentify a license plate number. It's when, if people are going to actually do violent crime, they're they're quite likely to go out and steal somebody else's license plate and put that on their car. So there's instances where people get pulled over and you know get rousted as if they're uh, bank robbers or something when when all they are is the victim of a license plate switch. So these technologies are just not what they're cracked up to be, but they but but there, there's no there's no sense of making these companies accountable. Right. Well, it, it's, it's just, it's for, for the powerful, it, there, there's no downside for them. They're one, these companies are making a lot of money off of contracts with the government and the government is expanding its, its power, which is bipartisan. That's one of the mo, uh, the bipartisan parts of, of our government. And, and um, before we move on to the more global implications of this, I, something occurred to me because you talked a little bit about how, ankle how there's the sanitizing language of an ankle bracelet as opposed to an ankle cuff but the whole technology as as uh incarceration is in and of itself sanitizing 
um because th there's like you said before um there's a sense that oh if it's if it's a tech technology then it can't have racial biases it's just it's 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 almost religious in the way that people approach it that the, the, there is a sense that it's omnipotent and fair um and it it it, it i feel like it does sanitize the entire experience of incarceration and of surveillance in and of itself. Oh, yes, for sure. And I think so. The I mean, the way we've tried to push back against that, because there's so little data, the data we have is the lived experience of people who have been on these monitors, who have had a loved one on the monitor, who have tried to run some kind of community based programs with people who are on the monitor. And the, the lived experience of people is very different than you know, than what the salespeople or the state put forward about this technology, let alone what the the, the the sort of gurus of technology or big tech, as some people refer to them, who present technology as the savior, that technology is going to save us. And that's technology being accepted uncritically, uh, according to the mythology put forward by the companies that sell this. But I think it's, I think it's really important to stress that and, and you, I think you've been bringing this out in the way a lot of you know, you know, journalists and even some activists don't do, and that is, it's not the companies that drive this. The companies make profit out of it, but it takes state actors. It states, it takes public pu elected officials and decision makers to take that decision to provide resources for the people that are using these technology to make these contracts. So BI, the largest uh, electronic monitoring company in the US has like a, they have a, a monopoly on the technology that they put on uh, electronic monitors that they put on immigrants. Well, that they didn't get that. They didn't get that by themselves. They had to get that by going through the Department of Homeland Security and through Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So people in decision making positions are taking the decision, just like they did with building prisons and jails, that this is going to this is going to be helpful to somebody, and this is going to solve the problem. And we know it never, it hasn't solved any of the problems it was supposed to solve. Well, it's funny you say that because we ha just had a uh, someone write in uh, and send us a super chat on the YouTube chat. Left is best, writes, ankle monitors were key to sending migrants home with family and friends instead of having them crammed in cages. Think of the unintentional consequences. Um, well, I, I, I mean, I... I I don't know if that's is that is that's them writing and saying it's positive. I mean, the, we're about to get to a story later in the program on how ICE um, the, the sending them home with family and friends is not uh, how I would describe their treatment necessarily. But um, but but I I do want to uh, it's okay. I do want to expand a little bit on the the immigration point that you could. Can you talk a little bit about if you could if you could talk a little bit more about um, the experiences of migrants with this kind of electronic surveillance and how ICE has uh, used this kind of technology to its benefit on the border? Sure, maybe, to, but just to address a minute that the idea that it's better, or uh, because I mean I've um, encountered this argument: it's better than jail, it's better than prison, and I think. I mean, what I always say is that I'm never going to say to someone who's sitting in a jail or prison, especially during COVID time, oh, no, don't go on electronic monitor. It's really bad. Well, I know where you are is worse than that electronic monitor. But my but my point about that is that what we what we see as the best solution or the optimal solution for an individual isn't what we must look at when we look at the big picture. So, yes. Uh, if someone wants to come out of an immigration prison and 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 go and be with their family on electronic monitor, whatever the conditions are, maybe that's better for them as an individual. But is that what we are we are we content with that? Are we going to say this is good? This is the solution. Let's move on to something else. And that's our point around electronic monitoring. We don't want electronic monitors. We want we want people to be given resources and access to opportunities, and not be tracked, not be confined to their house, but be given a chance to connect with their families in the same way that that's not happening under ice and home and release and so forth what are the conditions under which people are now are are, are subject to when they're put on these monitors or under the uh, 
alter so-called alternatives to detention program of the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So what's and, and we're, we're seeing right now that the Biden administration is is cranking up the number of people that are going to be on surveillance They're in the past people. Most people who are under ice on electronic monitors were not actually under house arrest. They could pretty much move around in most instances, uh, but they were, but their, but their data was being tracked and used in many ways against them. But now they're going to start to introduce at least 12 hours a day of house arrests as they expand the the use of elect electronic monitors. So I mean, I'm predicting that that's going to get tighter. Number one, but number two, um, you know, organizations like Just Futures Law, Mihente have done incredible research looking at the ways in which companies like Palantir, LexisNexis, and so forth have been gathering the data on electronic monitoring. And this is one of the only instances where you can actually get national data because it's under ICE, whereas with the other mm. electronic monitors under county or state authority. So they're they're building all these networks of, you know, criminals and who's who's working and who's who's working without a permit and and also um who's a draw who's using state resources and not giving back right right and it's just expanding their the their cloud of knowledge um i i i, I want to now expand on what you talked about with palestine because that is just like that is just such an important point um because the Yes, it's a surveillance state, but it's not bound by state borders, by na national borders. These are um, the, the the surveillance of Palestine makes total sense given the fact that Israel and the United States have a close relationship when it comes to sharing technology and and um, the the murderous uh, technology that we that that we use in the Middle East, we often share with them as well, and of course, that's being used uh, on the in the oppression of the Palestinian people. They're already in an open air prison. Now, uh, let's monitor them and imprison them uh, even further. Yes, I mean, well, I think it's interesting. Also, the two of the biggest electronic monitoring companies in the U.S. are uh, is Israeli based. That's uh, Atenti and Supercom. So they're. I mean, as you've pointed out, they're really at the cutting edge of the development of a lot of, of a lot of this surveillance technology. And the fact the Palestinians are, you know, really experimental subjects for a lot of this for a lot of this technology. And what I was really trying to point out in that in that chapter is the fact that people are beginning to talk about open air prisons in the United States, and the fact that a, a lot of say black communities become like an almost like an open air prison with with the technologies that are that are used with with stingrays and surveillance cameras and and facial recognitions and license license plate readers and extensive police occupation and i mean i so i wanted people to connect the dots between you know what happens in those communities and what's happening in a place like palestine but also to realize that in palestine there's a whole other dimension to this and that is a that we have actual physical walls that keep them in there, physical barriers, and B, that the population is subject to military attack and bombing by the Israeli Defense Force, mm. which, you know, which isn't exactly what's happening in the U.S. But I, I, I think we just need to be aware how, that these things take different shape in different places, but there's still connections between the technology that's used and, most of all, the mentality of people that build systems that build these punitive systems, um, which are which target certain populations. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and I mean, I we we talk about that. We've talked about this a bit on the show before. The there is a, a lot of shadiness and lack of clarity on the extent of the United States operations in Africa, uh, where we have a larger presence than is widely publicized and my guess is there is i'm sure a lot of testing being done there in terms of surveillance technology but now i walk myself back a little bit there too because a lot of it's just happening here in the united states on poorer populations as well mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I th but i think there's an important international connection there that that the, the that the raw materials the minerals that are used for a lot of this surveillance technology are being mined in Africa by, you know, by children in some cases, by, you know, super exploited labor. So, I mean, I think that's another 
way of connecting the dots of you know even in our cell phones you know we have we have various minerals and so forth that are that are coming from places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo so we 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 rely on exploiting that labor in order to be able to 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 surveil you know c- countries and continents Yes. Well, I mean, your book is an incredible read. I would encourage everybody to check it out. James Kilgore, uh, author of Understanding Incarceration, Electronic Monitoring, The Surveillance State and the Future of Mass Incarceration. Uh, Thank you so much for being here with us and and bearing with us on our first day with our new streaming situation. I appreciate it. Thanks, Emma. It's been a great conversation. I appreciate your work. Absolutely. And you too as well.